Hey traders, hopefully you're having a good week. We're gonna start off this video by looking at a little bit of fundamentals, a little bit of macro, and getting a good understanding of the previous time we've had extremely low interest rates and what that breeded for the next handful of years and decades to come, mainly just looking at the United States. But first off, before we get into that, we're gonna be looking at the economic calendar for the day, mainly just looking at the CPI numbers, the consumer price index numbers, which is an indication of inflation because that is the increase or decrease as a percentage on uh, a purchase of goods and services that kind of fit in a basket. So we can see actually talking about GDP pretty uh, lo pretty low uh, compared to the forecast for uh, GBP UK. But the main thing for CPI, we see that it is increasing. And this is a pretty important sign. You know, we're trying to understand is there going to be further deflationary pressure within current economies because of the decrease in the velocity of currency, the saving mentality, and everything that comes along with that in terms of the, the deflationary pressure as well as a little bit of the demographics uh, as seen in Japan, kind of what we're seeing now with the baby boomer generation in the States, but there is deflationary pressure put in the economy right now, but we're still seeing slight inflation due to the money proliferation, the printing of currency. So the big question is, are we heading into a deflation where the dollar is going to rise? It's going to be difficult for equities to move to the upside, or are we going into an inflationary period uh, where the dollar is going to weaken quite substantially, CPI numbers are going to ex increase substantially, and we are going to want to look for metals because they are a fixed supply asset. So we really want to be paying attention to the consumer price index within this recent uh, environment. So we can see the CPI numbers for US was higher than the forecast, as well as GBP, the UK CPI numbers, uh, were higher than the forecast. And we also have New Zealand coming up. They do have a forecast of deflation of negative 0.5, but uh, we'll see how that goes. And we also see the CPI numbers for the euro. We see that there's a slight inflationary uh, increase there at 0.5 three but we'll see what that comes out to be on friday so we will be making sure that we're keeping up with the cpi numbers because that's going to be very important in understanding the inflation not just in the united states but globally so now that we understand that we're going to now go into the history of the united states when they had extremely low interest rates and expansion in credit which then breeded the inflationary environment of the 70s where CPI hit double digits. So this is the history. We see that during World War I and the Great Depression and World War II, there was really just a massive drop in interest rates. And what we're primarily going to focus on is after the Great Depression and World War II, they had interest rates after around 1945, we can see at around 2%. Uh, for basically almost a decade and a half, they had extremely low interest rates. And then what we see after is a massive move to the upside in the interest rates. And why is that? It's because on the blue, we have the consumer price index. This is what we were talking about within the previous uh economic calendar where we're talking about inflationary percentages uh, for the cost of goods and we see when inflation rises effective federal funds rate which is going to be interest rates rise as well which is going to make it harder for businesses to borrow money it's going to be dif more difficult for individuals to borrow money which obviously if it's going to be di more difficult to borrow money one man's spending is another man's earnings so the overall economic stimulation is going to get reduced. Um, so we can see that right here and we'll actually look at the equities market within this range as well. But the main thing I want to take away from this chart is the CPN numbers when inflation rises, the one action that central banks are probably going to take is to increase the interest rates, increase the effective federal funds rate in order to try to reduce the inflation because the economy is overheating. 
So now that we understand that situation, we're going to quickly look at the Federal Reserve and the financial crisis. This is just a random slide I found on the website. We said during World War II and subsequently, the Fed was pressed by the Treasury to keep long-term interest rates low to allow the government debt occurred during the war to be financed more cheaply. This is the main thing. Keeping interest rates low even as the economy was growing strongly risked economic overheating and inflation. And we can see just a little bit down here. Starting in the mid-1960s, monetary policy was too easy. This stance led to a surge in inflation and inflation expectations. Inflation peaked at around 13%. Now, this is uh, the Dow Jones during that time. And then we see this red uh, drawing. That is what I put for the interest rates. Uh, they were unavailable, but then the actual interest rates on trading view started in 1954 and we can see back at the end of world war ii until up until maybe 50 1954 we had around two percent uh for the federal funds which is extremely low and up until 79 they had a very easy monetary policy where they were caring more about low interest rates and trying to not increase the debt on the uh borrowed money for paying for world war ii they wanted to make it cheap so they had interest rates low and what happened if we zoom in we saw a massive boom in the stock market take a look at this right here because we're going to go back to it this huge move right here it came from 1948 to basically at the high of uh, 1980 really so it was a huge very long lasting bull market let's say it really started booming in the 1950s so at the start of end of 49 1950s to 1980s so it was a very long bull market and we can see it was surging making strong higher highs and higher lows especially this last push from 1962 to 1960 around six massive and what happened after right it was stagnating it wasn't really doing anything and we can see during this time this was not the time for equities this was the time to be looking at things that have a fixed supply or a supply that isn't going to get uh, you know, proliferated or being able to change the supply instantly, like a central bank can change the supply of money. So right now, what we're seeing is, uh, well not right now, but what we saw here is, let's look at gold and silver. Let's just go to the different page. During that time, when stocks were completely sideways, we saw from around 1970 to 1980, this is the price of gold. It went from around $240 in 1970 to over $2,000 in 1980. This is silver. Went from, let's say, around $11.50 in 1970 to over $118 at 1980. Right, so in a 10 year period, you're getting over 10x in your, uh, in your investment. And then what we see during the stock market is just complete sideways markets, not really doing anything. We see huge sell-offs that are getting more and more aggressive, right? And this span was from 65 until 80, where equities did absolutely nothing. So understanding the situation we were in economically and in terms of the monetary policy where we had extremely low interest rates and it created massive expansion in credit and then we had this big boom that makes sense right and at a certain point inflation is going to catch up to us cpi numbers are going to increase and central banks have to lower interest or sorry raise interest rates in order to combat inflation and the debasement of their currency right and that makes it difficult for businesses to grow and receive money or cheap currency because if with if you have cheap currency you can just borrow and you're taking prosperity out of the future and bringing it to yourself today and if you're putting that capital into good use it's very beneficial but if it's harder to borrow money it's harder to grow at a rapid pace so businesses aren't going to be growing at a rate that they would have let's say when you had an interest rate that was extremely low compared to what we're seeing in around 74, right? So that makes sense just objectively. Um, and I think we're going to get to that zone right now. And in terms of where we are in the economic cycle, 
I kind of think we're in this last little phase here where we had our huge equity market with low interest rates supporting us through and through all the way up until kind of the euphoric period where everyone is in equities and we're going to get a period where there's going to be higher interest rates in my or higher interest rates due to higher inflation in my opinion. Once that happens, I'm not going to say that there's going to be another great depression, but we could have just stagflation, sideways action. Equities is not going to be the place to be unless you are specifically looking at things like gold miner shares, GDX, GDXJ. Uh, if you're looking at crypto, you could look at Mara, you could look at Grayscale's company, you could look at GBTC, I believe it's called, you could look at Dash, uh, ticker symbol, it's an equity, stuff like that, that will give you exposure to the cryptocurrency market. Um, in equities, that's an option, but in terms of like just investing in Dow Jones, S&P, Russell 2000s, stuff like that, um, during this time, it's just not going to cut it. You're basically flat for like five years, right? That's not something that I want to be a part of. So what do I want to do during this time? I want to be looking at fixed supply assets, right? And then what we saw after is once we saw the Volcker area, which uh, this individual really wanted to curb inflation because it was obviously a worry. So he raised interest rates quite aggressively and inflation slowed down. And then you got the Greenspan era, which uh, basically started the extremely low interest rate environment we're currently in right now. So look at how high interest rate interest rates were back then. And since Greenspan, they have just been lowering, creating lower lows and lower highs. So in my opinion, we're basically near around the extreme lows of interest rates and we will inevitably create some level of inflation because we are overheating the economy and the central banks not just in the united states but around the world will have to raise interest rates in order to combat the debasement of their currency once that happens, I do think that uh, the velocity of the currency will turn, there will be increasing CPI numbers, and it will be very difficult to curb inflation because it's very difficult to change the psychology of the masses in terms of the velocity of currency. So I think that's going to be the case. So let's now look at a potential example. And the way I'm looking at this is once the Greenspan era came in, that is when the uh, lower interest rates environment started. And then we see an initial boom, and this was taken, this uh, bars pattern was taken from the end of World War II to the peak right around there in 1979. So we had a huge boom in the equities market, and then we saw a lot of just stagflation, and this is taken exactly from there. So we see consolidation, consolidation after not much happening, nice consolidations and then we see our we see our huge massive boom right this was this right here looks very similar we see a huge boom consolidation and then we have uh, another boom that's not going to be absolutely perfect but you can kind of see it does look similar and then what thing what I think looks very similar is going to be this move right here where we just get a massive boom kind of at the end of uh, our rally or end of the bull market. And then I'm, I don't think we're going to go into like a massive 80% correction, but I don't want to be in equities if they're going to be something like this. If they're going to be doing something where they're just consolidating sideways and inflation is increasing substantially, I want to be in cryptocurrencies and precious metals. And that's where my focus is right now. So I'll just leave this here. Uh, it doesn't look exactly the same, but in terms of how aggressive this bull market has been for equities and the combination of the bull market in line with the low interest rate environment that we've created for the past you know, three decades, four decades, I think that, uh, we're, or I guess three decades, we're going to, in my opinion, see an overheating of the economy, which will create inflation within the currency, which then will lead to central banks increasing interest rates, which will then lead to uh, business development decreasing due to the difficulty of obtaining credit, which will then make it more difficult for equities to rise in the equity market. And then when you have monetary uncertainty, you are going to have a run on 
uh, assets that have fixed supply like gold, silver, crypto. So I think it's setting up right now in the macro scope of things. So um, that's why my focus is on metals and cryptocurrencies, mainly currencies. Yes, uh, extremely liquid, but you know, I would never put money in a currency for like appreciation. It's just for trading and making sure I'm making a living for myself basically. But um, in, in terms of investments, yeah, uh, my 100% my focus is going to be metals and crypto for sure. Equities is not going to be extremely on my radar unless I'm looking at things like GDX, which is a ETF for gold miners, or GDXJ, which is the juniors, which is small cap, more speculative, but they have the potential to 1x, 2x, 5x, whatever the case may be. So I will be looking at those types of equities, uh, silver miner ETFs, gold mining ETFs, stuff like that. As well as, like I said before, the equities that are related to cryptocurrencies, Dash, Mara, those types of uh, equities. So that's going to be the uh, fundamental, more global macro side of the video. Let's just bring this over and then quickly look to see if we have any comments. Don't see anything just yet. All right, so we're now gonna get into the global macro update, looking at a bunch of different charts here. So hopefully you got something out of this video, trying to create a framework in which we kind of have an understanding of where we are and where we could possibly go from the environmental factors that we're currently seeing in the monetary policy, not just in the United States, but in the really global financial markets, because this is truly a globalized world that we're living in at this point. So, all right, that's a little, lot of talking about uh, economics. Hopefully you understand it. Let's jump right into the S&P 500, which is uh, the 500 largest companies in the States. So let's just close that. Gonna get a little bit of water and then we'll jump right into the charts here. All right, and epic.com says, is the bull market done for the S&P? So we'll actually talk about this while we go through this chart. Uh, so in terms of, is the bull market done? I would say it still has a little bit of uh, gas left, but if you're looking for longs, I personally wouldn't look at the S&P. I view the S&P as one of my key indicators to assess the risk sentiment or risk tolerance for global investors and traders. I don't trade it too much, but that's the main tool for the S&P. If you're looking for a long opportunity in US equities, just giving my two cents, the NASDAQ has been a relatively strong index compared to basically every single index, not just in the US, but globally speaking, there's some indexes that have been doing pretty well. Uh, the DAX is doing decent. The S&P is doing decent. But overall, the uh, the ticker symbols NDX, so the NASDAQ 100, or overall the NASDAQ is, in my opinion, the strongest in terms of relative strength compared to every other index. So I would say the NASDAQ does have some more to go because it's just on an absolute bull run and as long as the extremely low interest rates remain or they even get reduced to even less i think that this run could continue but um in terms of opportunities i would say that equities would not be like in terms of general indexes and equities would not be the place for the most appreciation i would say that metals in crypto would be the better place for potential price appreciation. You could look at equities like uh, gold miners, silver miners, and cryptocurrency related uh, companies like Dash or like GDX for gold miners, GDX J for juniors and all that stuff. But um, that is completely up to you. Uh, S&P carried by tech. I see tech breaking down recently. Yes, so um, we actually talked about that within our Discord. Um, we are somewhat discussing that, but like I said, I'm not extremely focused on equities. I'm mainly focused on the three things that we're talking about in this video. How's it going, truck nubs? Hopefully you're having a fantastic day. So now we're going to be looking at uh, the equities here. We see a question from Tron, but we will get into that within the crypto market. On the daily chart, let's just jump right into it. We see our first 
anchor point right here and then we see our second touch point and then we see this long well-respected resistance that was able to hold the price below a certain zone and when we really zoom in we did see this big wick rejection which indicated to us that there was lots of sell pressure keeping the price below this major resistance zone right around here but the fact that we were able to stay within this consolidation we were able to hold this key level of support which was a previous resistance right here really really showed us that uh, this was potentially a reaccumulation phase and we don't yet see this one hour can or sorry this daily candle close this one right here but if it does close above this zone and if it close green i'm going to call it a breakout and then the previous resistance right here is going to be the new level of support like we can see so what i'm looking for is now a structure to form like here where you have this previous uh, resistance turning to support you could be consolidating here for a bit but it does look like with the break of the horizontal zone as well as the descending zone and confluence adding additional sell pressure onto the price action the fact that we broke above it gives me uh, confidence that we could be continuing to the upside uh, overall risk on sentiment does look like it is continuing uh, we do see in terms of the overall markets things like the euro retracing like it should be for a risk off currency canadian dollar is spiking quite a bit today indicating that a risk on currency is getting a bid further validating our thesis for the sentiment and we also see chf which is the swiss franc really doing poorly which is even again further validation that risk off currencies are not getting a bid in risk on currency Currencies like CAD, like ODD, are doing better. So overall analysis is uh, looking like we are continuing the risk on sentiment, and I'd like to see this candle closure on the daily chart before I make any real uh, decisions or, or, or assumptions or anything like that. But uh, if it does close here, that would be great to see. And like I said on the daily. That's a very important zone that we would be closing above. So I think it could be a little bit choppy here. I'm not really loving the fact that we broke above, came right back down. We did hold this previous support as, again, a new level of support. And if we're going to close here, that would be nice to see. But I would be a little bit hesitant, I think. If we're going to get a little bit of chop, I don't really want to be a part of it like that. We could see something like that where you do get a candle closure, you get a lot of chop, you get contraction and volatility. And I think this next zone that I'd like to see break is 30 to 34, somewhere around there. This previous high that we hit in early June, around June 8th, would be the major zone I'd like to see the price pass before I make any major uh calls for gaining or increasing exposure for risk on trades so right now we're just consolidating we could consolidate like we did last time for a while uh don't want to be in trades that are consolidating for like four or five days it just does not make sense i'd just be you know holding on to a trade that's doing absolutely nothing so uh in terms of the next potential pretty significant move if we start consolidating i think that there's going to be Quite a bit of demand to support the previous level of resistance and if we do break that previous high then we could really see another little bit of a melt up kind of like we saw within this zone we saw a resistance we saw a resistance we saw a previous support so there's a lot of sell pressure here and once that sell pressure got broken uh, and invalidated and you started to trend upwards you started to see a parabolic kind of increase in price and I think if we do start to see a consolidation and then an increase above that zone, I think that a lot of shorts are going to get out of the market. People who are already bullish are going to be even more happy, more excited, making more money. So they might add on to their positions. And that's a pretty psychological level because that means the structure is holding its higher high and higher low structure. We're not holding a support or uh, sorry, we're not holding a resistance. We're not forming a top or forming a higher high, which is in terms of a structural trend on an uptrend. So that's going to be my analysis on the S&P. Uh, I'd like to see it consolidate a little bit further, but the main thing I wanted to see it do is hold for about two more hours on the daily chart. If it's able to do that, I'd call it a breakout and then I'd be looking for a little bit more of a risk on trading approach, but uh, I do have to be a little bit cautious of 
that noise that I talked about before the actual move because we got a lot of noise breaking up, came back down, held the support, came back up, holding, it's a lot of noise and it's not very clear and clean. So if you're looking for dependability, it would make more sense to see that hold, make a move to the upside, breaking the previous high, validating that as a new level of support and that's gonna be a much higher level of dependability for potential opportunity to gain exposure for longs. So that's going to be my analysis on the SMP. Uh, quick look at the Russell 2000. So I think this has invalidated my head and shoulders. So it is, I think there's definitely some people who've entered short here. If you're looking at this potential head and shoulders right here, which we've been talking about for a while, that was the initial right shoulder. It just would not crack the neckline. And the fact that if it does close with uh, this daily candle above the previous candle closure we had on early or mid-June, that would invalidate this head and shoulders and we would then call it a, a higher high, which then we've already made a higher low. So you could argue that this is a potential, just consolidation and a potential move to the upside where we're gonna get a test of, let's get the rectangular zone of this high right here, previous level of resistance. So that's gonna be the next level of a significant supply, which is overall a risk on move. And uh, if the Russell 2000 is going up, you'd definitely expect the NASDAQ to be doing well as well because the Russell 2000 is small caps. And uh, the NASDAQ is really kind of the at-home companies that are doing very, very well. The Netflixes, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts, the NVIDIAs, all that sort of uh, stuff. All right, so we do see this previous level of resistance turn into support, so that is great to see. Let's just get the brush. So we see resistance, 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 and we also see a support here turn into a support with confluence with that ascending zone. So we know that there's a decent amount of demand around the 10.5-ish zone, so right around here, and we are holding it, which is great. Um, so overall, it does look pretty strong. Let's go into a smaller time frame here to see what we can find. We are forming a nice recovery where the previous resistance is turning into a nice new level of support, creating solid structure within the market. This previous resistance is acting as a nice new level of resistance as well. So if you are looking for opportunities to, let's say, buy the dip, if you are looking at potential higher lows, that could be an option. If you're looking for more dependability, once it cracks that higher high and then uh, holds that higher low, you could be looking for an opportunity to be continuing the trend upwards. But overall, unless it starts breaking down, breaking the 10.5 range or 10 point, let's say four range, I do expect the NASDAQ to continue to climb. So that's going to be my uh, view on the NASDAQ. It's holding, so it's looking pretty risk on and uh, my view is going to remain the same. So the VIX, the volatility index, did move up within our consolidation zone, our horizontal sideways channel for a little bit there, but it did get rejected pretty aggressively and now we're, now we're at our higher lows. So we do have a chance back to get this nice fade that we're looking for right here that would create a great opportunity for risk on exposure because if we do get a fade like this, we most likely are going to be seeing the SPX slowly incrementally move to the upside which is absolutely great for more speculative trades because when the volatility is decreasing on the VIX it's a great indication of risk on sentiment and environment so that is what we're going to be looking for if it does break this ascending zone and that would be really great to see and let's just get that zone right there nice and green. So that's going to be the VIX. We did get a little bit of a worries, but if we just go to the four hour, maybe the six hour, it, did, it is holding above that zone. Maybe even on the daily, the daily is even holding. Hoping for a candle closure right at that $30 kind of 60 cent range, but uh, maybe not. that's not going to happen. But we do see overall volatility is dropping, which is definitely a sign that it is uh, continuing the risk on sentiment. So that's going to be the VIX that we're going to be talking about and going to quickly look to see if uh got any comments no comments all right cool so that's going to be the equities in the united states quick look at the japanese equities and then going on to the global formed a higher high so that's definitely a risk on sentiment that we're making new highs 
Now testing that high that basically a lot of these uh, indexes hit in mid, let's say June, right around here. So definitely the equities are moving to the upside, which is continuing the risk on momentum. You see the ASX, which is the Australian stock market index, do something a little bit similar. We can just move that a little bit. It's not really perfect. Maybe I'll just go like that. But it's not really perfect. We are forming, uh, I guess you could call it a ascending triangle or you can call it a symmetrical triangle where you get these lower highs and higher lows. But it is holding a series of higher lows, which is indicating bullishness in my opinion. Got that nice bullish candle. We did form a higher high from this high right there. And now we're testing the next high there. So definitely slowly creeping to the upside for the Australian stock market. UK's... FTSE 100 has been relatively weak, but it is holding our previous level of support right around there at around 60.76. Testing that high, not really hitting that previous high, but overall we are creating a descending triangle or just a consolidation where we're kind of contracting in price action. The DAX is doing pretty good. It's actually at the high that it hit back in early June. So it's actually doing better than all these different uh, equities or indexes, I should say, as well as the S&P, because the S&P has not reached the early June high. Like we can see, uh, if we zoom back, the early June high, oh, I guess we have hit it, never mind. Yeah, yeah so I am mistaken. The S&P has hit that. Whereas things like the Russell 2000 has not. And then if we're looking at the Japanese stock market, the Australian stock market, uh, we do see that DAX is doing better compared to a lot of different indexes. So overall bullishness is still going to, uh, looks like continue within the equities market, which is overall a risk on uh, instrument, depending on what you're trading uh, in terms of equities. But overall, these indexes are classified as risk on. So it does look pretty favorable for the bulls. All right, so now we're gonna quickly look at uh, the bonds, which are not really doing much, which I don't mind at all. It's not a bad thing to really just see some consolidation on these things if you are looking at risk on opportunities. We see the US dollar currency index really drop, which is a weakening of the dollar, which is great to see for risk on movements. And we are, we're just holding a nice descending channel formation where we're able to hold the series of lower lows as well as lower highs with a trend line on both the roof uh, and uh, floor of this descending trend. So we broke a major level at 96.30. We're testing the low right here that we hit in June 10th, right around there. So it does look like we could get a little bit of a move up, which would mean that we would get a little bit of a sell off within the equities market, which makes sense because we did talk about a little bit of uh, noise that could come in here within the equities because on the daily, it does look clean, but on the four hour, it looks a lot less clean. So having a little bit of noise, a little bit of consolidation wouldn't really be such a bad thing. And then we get a retest of this previous support right here, which would turn into a new level of resistance and confluence within this descending trend line. So that would be a really good location to be looking for weak dollar risk on our uh, weak dollar exposure, I should say, right around there. Once you see validation that there's sell pressure and this previous support is gonna be acting as a new level of resistance, that could be an opportunity where you're looking for short dollars and then you're just looking to continue the trend downwards. Um, and hopefully during that same time, you're gonna see the SPX move to the upside as well, which would just create a really great picture for the overall global macro uh, environment and sentiment and analysis. So that would be great to see. As of now, I think we could be retesting these previous lows as a new level of resistance. That would be nice to see. And then we just get uh, something like this, where we get a retest and then just another nice little sell off. Something like that would be really great to see where you hold this zone yet again, and then you're continuing to hold this trend line. So that would be awesome. Um, and that is what we're going to be looking for within the structure of the DXY is literally just that right there continuing the trend except we're going to see a little bit above a little bit of a bump ideally all right so that's going to be the us dollar currency index looking pretty good following structure not much more to say it's looking really good and then let's just discuss a little bit of a risk on currency australian dollar has been doing pretty well compared to the us dollar just quickly looking at it we see that we were forming a squeeze a high base a horizontal sideways channel whatever you want to call it we broke to the upside. You can also 
use the, uh, let's get the brush. We can also connect this high, this candle closure, and then one, two, three as a new level of support right around here. So we're definitely at a key level of demand in confluence with not only the lower highs, but also these horizontal resistances, which are acting as a new level of support. So I'm pretty bullish on odd USD and the overall risk sentiment is going to be in line with the global sentiment for this particular trade and then we do see that it's uh, holding that support well so it looks pretty strong for the aussie dollar in my personal opinion just an example of a fx trade looking at the fundamentals and then you can also just think okay well if i'm going to be looking to long a risk on currency you could do odd cad oops odd cat to see which one's doing better we can see canadian dollar has been doing well recently but it could just be retesting this resistance because overall australian dollar has been doing way way better than the canadian dollar as we can see so then we could do odd new zealand as well to get a good understanding of why odd may be a good play compared to some other currencies that are risk on so we can see uh recently odd has been doing well here although new zealand has been pulling uh, it's strength a little bit back, but um, overall we see on the larger trend, we are holding this nice level of support and we just came from a huge impulsive push for strength in Australian dollar. And then GBP odd, quickly looking at the last thing we can see, Australian dollar is much stronger than GBP and Australian dollar is already pulling away uh, stronger than GBP right now. So it does look like odd is the play and then you can just look at things that are on risk off. So Euro USD looking definitely, I would say Euro is stronger right now. You could do USD JPY to see, all right, which one's gonna be stronger for USD versus JPY. Really, it's just in a consolidation, but we are forming these series of lower highs like that. So I would say if I had to pick, I would rather be in the weakening of the US dollar versus Japanese yen in my personal belief, because we do see that descending zone. You can argue that we're forming kind of like a weakening structure where you have that support and then you have a base right there turn to a resistance and you're kind of getting a topping pattern and then you see this next little base right here break so structure is definitely going to the downside you see a nice little base right here structure is definitely going to the downside so overall, I definitely say that uh, the US dollar is weakening against a yen. So that makes sense. Odd, odd USD would be a, a good overall place to be looking for long opportunities. And that's the way that you look at the FX world using the risk on risk off and relative strength and weakness in my personal opinion. So that's going to be my uh, pair that I'm just going to be keeping an eye on just with the global macro update. And then we're now going to get into the metals. So we're going to go into first the gold and silver ratio, and then we're going to jump into the gold chart and then silver. So we've already talked about this many, many times, and we see that gold is yet again pulling away in strength from gold, making a lower low. So things are really going according to plan here for the metals market, and we see silver strengthening again really close to that target of around 1960 so it's really getting close we see that previous resistance turn into new support very beautifully which we talked about and then we also see in my opinion gold looks like it's really trying to break out here where we see this previous resistance multiple times let's just get our snip which we do not have so we will get a snip i don't love uh using the uh, the brush i'd much rather use the uh, snip because it's just a lot easier to write with so what i'm looking for ideally is we see this candle closure right here perfectly and then we see a type a so this is a type b candle closure this is a type a this would be classified in my opinion as a type b right there and then this would be a little bit of an invalidation but a type b and this would be a type a right along here so this horizontal level is very well respected we also have a descending zone connecting the lower highs which is now respecting as a new level of support and we can see that with the anchor point right here we see one two three and then we see this hold as a support very well and especially in the later part of the consolidation you see wicks coming down but you see the price getting picked back up and now 
we're contracting, contracting in volatility, and then it looks like we're expanding in volatility now. So we see a contraction where we're getting less and less movement within the price action, and then we're seeing an extreme level of low volatility where we're contracting like here, and then we see this, which is just absolutely no movement, which kind of breeds large moves. And we can see back in the historic time frames, just looking at it, contraction, expansion, you get contractions, you get expansions and all that stuff, right? It just makes sense in the markets. The market has to breathe. The market moves in ways. You're looking for contraction within this zones and expansions within this zones, right? So in terms of the overall structure, I like the fact that we're contracting in volatility and it looks like we're expanding with lots of wicks to the downside, indicating buy pressure, keeping the price above a certain zone. And all I'm looking for is the price to break this zone. You could have two you can have multiple options, but one option would be a stop entry. So you're just looking to literally enter as soon as the price breaks above this zone. And then another thing you'd look for is you look for, I guess, a second entry, which could also be a stop entry. You could use a limit order, but you're looking for candle closure to break and hold, creating a higher high. And you're looking for that higher low to hold. You could put a limit order once it comes down. You could put a stop entry above the high. You could put a stop entry above the retest candle high, whatever your system is. That is uh, an opportunity, in my opinion, for gold because it does look strong. And we are going to be looking at the CPI numbers. If the CPI numbers are going to increase, if the CPI numbers are going to increase, that means gold is probably going to increase as well because this is going to give us the number on inflation as a percentage. And if inflation is going up, we can see in historic times when there's monetary uncertainty, when they're printing too much money and money and credit is too easy, it leads to high inflation, right? So that is going to be the large macro outlook. And uh, obviously, they're printing a lot of money and making it really easy to borrow credit. So I'm very bullish on gold and silver, especially silver, but definitely gold as well. So it'd be nice to see that higher high and higher low. And we can even draw in a nice bars pattern to illustrate this uh, opportunity here. So let's just look maybe something like this. And then you're going to get the consolidation kind of like that. That's the consolidation I'm trying to draw in that is consolidating. And then you get a move to the upside. And then once it breaks to the upside, you're looking for retest of that previous resistance acting as a new level of support. And you're going to get your continuation to the upside, right? Maybe that wasn't the absolute best uh, illustration of uh, a chart. Maybe this would be a better way. Yeah, I think this is going to be a better way. Um, probably maybe something like this. Let's bring that up there. Maybe something like that. So I'd like to see candle closure and retest, maybe something a little bit like that. But you wanting to see that previous resistance turn to a new level of support and that continuation. And then just looking at the size of the wedge or the symmetrical triangle, you can kind of draw a target there potentially. And then you have uh, systematic ways of letting your targets or your trades run for as long as it can. So whatever the case may be, you could use moving averages, parabolic stars, you could use just moving it up structurally speaking. So if it holds supports and breaks a new resistance, you put it just below the low of the previous support, stuff like that. But whatever the case may be, whatever the structure is and the method and tool that you use, that's an option. So silver does look, uh, gold, sorry, does look pretty bullish in my opinion. But what we're really going to be looking on uh, for continuation is going to be silver. So I didn't really add throughout this whole way. I just got the nice solid entry there and have been incrementally moving up my stop loss. And uh, basically, this is the new market structure that I'm holding above. And it looks really awesome, but uh, I don't really feel the need to sell right when it goes to that zone if it's just going to continue running, right? It just kind of does not make sense to me. It's good to have take profits, but... Uh, with the gold and silver ratio, just moving to the downside with dollar weakening and continuing to just collapse, I think that silver is just going to continue going. So I will be looking for continuation patterns on silver. I'll keep what I have on um, so I can just keep on adding more to my size, which would be absolutely phenomenal. And then on gold, I will be looking to add exposure as well. But keep in mind, gold and silver are positively correlated. So you will have a pullback that is going to move both of them. So if you have, let's say a max 2% risk on your entire portfolio and you're long with 2% risk on gold, if you put another trade on silver and if gold goes down, you can pretty much be sure that silver is going to be hitting your stop loss as well. So I would say if you have to pick one, silver is looking like it's stronger due to the gold and silver ratio dropping. 
but overall both the gold as well as silver uh, in terms of a opportunity technically speaking does look extremely bullish and from a fundamental standpoint i do think that it looks really strong as well like i said we do have to keep in mind the cpn numbers that are coming out and uh, if it's going to be a deflationary number if it's negative that could negatively impact the price of these fixed supply assets but uh we've already seen the us and gbp come out saying that they are slowly increasing the uh expansion or the inflation or the cpi numbers which is bullish for gold and silver in my opinion um dog flea says what are any other good rare earth metal funds i don't know anybody any about rare earth metal funds to be completely honest i just know gdx and gdxj in terms of opportunities um i'm mainly focusing on just those two for opportunities as well as actively trading uh, either futures or cdfs like actually just trading like the, the metal itself, not actually trading like companies. So that's the way I navigate the markets. Um, everyone can go at their own pace and kind of figure out their way. So um, don't really have a whole lot of information for you on that other than the two that I have already mentioned. Um, Boy Tom says, what broker do you use? So I use a mixture um, in terms of global macro I could use CMC, which is a really good one. Uh, Hugo's Way, which is a really good one. Uh, those are the main ones. You could even trade like FX on Binance. It's pretty crazy. Um, very interesting, actually. So there's a lot of options for that. Um, and on the, well, mainly use CMC, but you could use a bunch of different on other ones. But um, for crypto, I mainly use Bybit and Binance because they have really good liquidity and they don't have really shit slippage like BitMEX. BitMEX has some really bad slippage sometimes if you use uh, stop losses and it's in a really quick market, not the great, not the greatest. So check out our Discord if you want to learn more because it does depend on where you live. You may not be able to use the normal Binance account if you just use, or if you're in living in America, but um, you can use Binance Futures, I believe, which is pretty interesting. So. Last thing we're going to look at is going to be a little bit of crude oil. So I think because the U.S. dollar is weakening so much, crude oil is actually being able to hold on to its high here. I don't think it's getting a whole lot of bid volume, but it's just the weakening of the dollar that's just making it slowly crawl up. It's already broken its ascending trend line. It is holding this resistance of horizontal sensitivity right here, which is pretty important in my view of like a zone that we need to hold in order for us to continue its horizontal consolidation, but we're just really not seeing a whole lot of movement. Uh, but it does look a little bit more, I can't say bearish, but I think it's going to hold and continue its consolidation instead of continuing its upward movement in my personal opinion, but not a whole lot to discuss on oil. It's kind of just been consolidating, forming higher lows, although not very aggressive. And we're right next to a major level of supply. So definitely wouldn't want to be looking for longs just yet for WTI, Western Texas Intermediate, in my opinion. All right, so that's going to be the completion of the global macro updates. We're just going to quickly move back to the SMP. Actually, I might stick. I probably I have gold on this other chart. I'm just going to be quickly changing the structure that I have on my other monitor because I do have uh, a decent amount of monitors here uh, and that is on the four hour chart so I will just switch this to a two hour chart yeah that's a lot better of a view also if anyone has any questions please don't hesitate to ask and I will uh, definitely help you as best I can if you have any questions about trading or like economics or something I really do enjoy discussing it so definitely don't hesitate so I'm just drawing the other chart for gold really quickly so I have a chart to work off of on my other monitor in case it does move I know where my levels are that I'm looking for which is pretty important so just quickly getting that done right around there all right so that looks pretty good I'm pretty happy with the overall structure for gold i think gold does look like it's in a pretty decent opportunity but um i would say the play would be silver if i had to pick between the two and 
I did pick silver and uh, it turned out to be the right choice, let's say. Definitely the right choice. So, um, let's look at this. Uh, are there any good DeFi exchanges? The DeFi market has doubled in the month. Uh, currently, I do not know of any DeFi exchanges that I use or would recommend, but uh, the Performante team and myself are looking into that opportunity, although um, with the amount of information I have right now, I cannot recommend anything that uh, I personally use, have used, or really recommend. So in a little bit, I'll be able to give you a little bit more of an answer on that, but for now, I do not. So that is the global macro update. We're now going to jump into the crypto market update, quickly looking at the SPX here because we do see it is moving to the upside. So I'm going to leave gold here just uh, for me to see it. Silver looks good, so I'm not going to be doing anything on that. And then we're going to now be looking at some, uh, let's just look at, I'm just going to be looking at the FX real quickly. This is the Australian dollar. I got the nice uh, Australian dollar Swiss franc, which is kind of basing, which is good. Canadian dollar Swiss franc, which is on an absolute roar. This is what I was talking about. Canadian dollar just really, really ramping up. Uh, as well as this, Canadian dollar is really outbeating or, or outperforming the US dollar by a long shot. And we can just create a nice little zone here as well as copy it. And then we got the nice little horizontal level, just like that. All right, so we're now going to get into the crypto market. So we're going to go over BTC and all of our uh, normal tools that we use to analyze the cryptocurrency market. So let's actually first look at the volatility to see if volatility is still reducing. And it does look like it is volatility is still contracting. It's coming down to the previous low we had in early March of 2019, when we went from four or 4,200 to 14K. So we're contracting in volatility, which means we don't wanna be looking at Bitcoin. Why would we wanna be trading something that is contracting in volatility when we have things that are expanding in volatility that is creating strong trends that have continuation patterns that are well-respected to the upside that give you dependability and great risk reward structure. It just does not make sense. So that is why we're predominantly focusing our time in the crypto market in the relatively strong alts not just any alt we don't just randomly pick from the list and say hey this one looks good we specifically look at a tool that illustrates which alts are relatively strong which alts have been outperforming the rest of the basket of cryptocurrencies that we are looking at and that is how we initially find our potential setups and then we use our method of approaching the markets to make sure that we are systematically trying to do the same thing over and over and over. That is basically our method of trading is we have a system, we have an approach and uh, we don't just randomly open up a chart. We have a structured way of kind of a step-by-step -step process. How do we go about finding even a pair to trade? Not just let's just find a symmetrical triangle. How do we find the best pair to trade? And then we dive into the price action. So. Volatility is reducing, meaning that we should not be in Bitcoin. If we're looking at the six hour chart, we're just really not doing much, right? We're, look how, sh look how small of a move this is going to be, right? We're just contracting in volatility. Let's see what the percentage is. This is a 1.65, 1.8% move. Unless you're like leveraging five times or more, this is really difficult and with the leverage becomes higher fees and you're basically going to get like a one-to-one -one, maybe one to two if you're like really minimizing your risk within this structure but it's really difficult to trade within this zone when you have zero trend and overall just kind of noise and random wicks up and down it just does not make sense it's a nice it's not a nice clean chart to look at but we will then uh, continue on with uh, our analysis of if the altcoin market is really looking strong. So this is gonna be the BTC dominance chart, which is showing the percentage of the cryptocurrency market held in just Bitcoin. And we can see that there's a support here. If you go to, for example, the weekly, we see a descending, you could call it a wedge, where you see first, second, and third rejection. And we also now are holding a previous level of resistance, 
multiple times, which is acting as a support. So it's a pretty important demand zone at around the 62.8, uh, pretty close to uh, the Fib level, which you could probably get um, pretty close. But overall, we're nearing a demand zone and if it does break through this key zone of horizontal significance, I think the altcoin market will be the place to be. Yes, the appreciation of Bitcoin will be great. There's no denying that at all. I think everyone who has exposure in the altcoin market should have exposure in Bitcoin because it is the most uh, liquid. It is the kind of king of the cryptos, right? But in terms of capital allocation as a percentage in your portfolio, you should be, or not you should, uh, it makes sense in my opinion to be heavier in alts when Bitcoin is losing dominance because that means other alts are taking and appreciating at a greater rate, taking more of the market share. Um, things like Link, Cardano, VET are doing just that, right? So let's now look at the altcoin market cap which is this guy right here and it's not really doing much mind you this is like an entire market cap of not just one alt uh, predominantly this is going to look similar to ethereum because ethereum does have a high market cap compared to the rest of the alts but we do see structurally speaking it's making nice strong higher highs higher lows breaking resistances holding supports and gearing up to test this major level at around 105 billion in market cap we see it was a key rejection level on around february in 2020 before the march meltdown and if we're really going to go back to the weekly we see that it was a major rejection and resistance zone and we're really just basing if we're really looking at the monthly here going at, at the log let's just zoom out here a little bit so we have a good understanding of where we are we are just kind of in a sideways consolidation, right? Where we formed a nice solid low or a floor and a nice ceiling on the monthly chart. So until we're breaking this consolidation zone, to me, the altcoin bull market has not started, right? So yes, we are looking at alts because there are some relatively strong alts that are outperforming BTC and Ethereum. But until we start to see this really break to the upside, there's no imminent, oh my God, we have to be in alts, this is it, which is great because we're already seeing lots of bids coming in, lots of buy pressure, appreciating these relatively strong alts and continuing the trend upwards. So we're already seeing bullishness within the alts before the major break. So if you're thinking that you're too late in a certain alt, if you're too late in Cardano, Link, whatever the case may be, we will have pullbacks inevitably and I think if this altcoin market cap does break to the upside, we will have a lot more to go. You do not need to worry that you're late. You are not late to the game. And uh, if what the start of the video suggested, where we talk about low interest rates, credit expansion, creating and breeding an environment where there's going to be high levels of inflation, there will be a run on, in my opinion, there will be a run on assets that have a fixed supply, including gold, silver, as well as cryptocurrencies. So if that is the case, if that is the outcome, I do think that these altcoins that are proving to be relatively strong will have exponential amounts of appreciation to go from where we currently are right now. So in my opinion, you're not late, you're still early, and there's a lot of opportunity out there in the crypto market. Uh, there's definitely some alts that will still 5x, 10x in my opinion. Like Link is at, let's say, I don't exactly know, $9. Just under $9, $8.50. For me to see Link at $85 is not unimaginable, definitely. Uh, in, my personally, in my personal opinion. Dog Leafs, oops. Didn't want to reply. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah, no problem. Boy Toms, do you live from doing this? Yes, I do live from trading in the financial markets. I've um, been doing this for over three years. Was not profitable all in the first year. Uh, could not live off it in the second year. Uh, I was making money, but uh, I was just keeping it in my portfolio. Could not withdraw because I was not making enough money. I was also working from home at the time and was able to work from home more or less full-time, sometimes part-time uh, as a self-employed contractor, not trading, uh, working for someone 
kind of like having a boss and stuff and then trading on the side so I could like trade in the mornings, do my work in the afternoon when the market was a little bit slower and then trade at night for the Asia session and the start of London. So I was just working a shit ton. And then the third year I started to weaned off the self-employment through uh, getting hired by another business and then relied more heavily on my trading profits. So it took like over two and a half years to really get to a point where I feel comfortable, but uh, it can be done. It is very challenging. Went through a lot of trials, tribulations, difficulties. Um, it's really not an easy battle in the first two years, but once you have a system and you don't really um, like veer off, and you have a very simple life, I guess you could say, it is not impossible. It is very plausible that you could do it. It's just, or very possible, not plausible, possible. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives you a little bit of hope, but it gives you a little bit of realization that you don't just open an account and instantly make money. Trucknub says, I heard that correct, link at $85. Um, <laughs> that was just saying, you know, I was just basically saying that there is a very high probability if we do get an altcoin market at this point to see altcoins that are going to be 10xing that have relative strength at this point. So right now we see link at around $8.5, right? I could see it 10 times for sure. We see things like BNB in the last bull run. We see things that have already done that. And with the amount of interest that is new coming into the cryptocurrency market, I think it's only going to get bigger. And let's just talk about the more serious case if that is, uh... oh, give me one second here. Uh, I'm just getting some questions here from the uh, TikTok here. The content is great and the speaker is cool. I think the only thing missing is a better marketing. Better marketing indeed. All right, so that's great. Uh... Great suggestion. So marketing as in like videos on TikTok, because we do really try to understand constructive criticism and learn from it and grow from it because that's, if, if you're not able to handle constructive criticism, you can't grow. So I really appreciate your two, uh, your two cents and, and thoughts into the reasons why uh, this is not growing at the rate of maybe potentially other people or how it could just be better, right? You're, we're comparing ourselves to the day prior. So in terms of better at marketing, in what way do you mean better at marketing for the overall growth of the channel? It'd be great if you could answer as well as truck nubs. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I heard that correctly. Yeah, so I did say $85. Um, in, in terms of overall investment, like I'm not a person that says it's going to hit $85. I would rather see the market trend and then see how the market is doing. Um, if that makes sense. Like before Link hits even, you know, $50 or $20, you're going to have BTC and things absolutely run. And let's say in a hypothetical world, if the uh, current monetary policy becomes very worrying and they start printing a lot of money and then they have interest rates increase because of the worry of inflation and then you see gold and silver rise and if there's actual debasement of currency like in a, in a hypothetical world there will be a point in time when the US dollar fails right every single currency has failed that's, that's a fiat currency every single one there's not a single one that stood the test of time over a, a human life really it, it's impossible that to, to even have a single one, right? The silver sterling is the longest one and it's lost 99.9% .9 of its value, right? So it's inevitable that the US dollar will collapse and they will proliferate the currency and debase it and devalue it and it will be worth absolutely nothing at one point in time, right? So if that is the case, there's a massive pool of capital, right? That is all in US dollars and not just US dollars, but all currency, right? What's What's that amount, right? I have no idea, but there's a shit ton of currency and capital in the US dollar, right? If that currency and that value of the dollar is going to decrease, people need to store their value somewhere, right? If you're having $10, 10 billion dollars and you're like a company, why would you leave your capital in a depreciating asset? You wouldn't. No one would if everyone knew that the US dollar is collapsing. They would all put it in somewhere. If there was 
a steamroller coming at you? Would you just stand there and say, I'm going to trust the Fed? No, you would look for another alternate way that doesn't get ended up with you getting run over by a steamroller. And that would mean putting your capital in places that is able to hold your value at a better rate than currency, that than fiat currency, which is historically gold and silver and potentially cryptocurrencies. And if this does come into fruition sooner than people would like, where there is massive, massive debasement in the US dollar, well then that's an entirely different economic environment than we're currently in right now. We don't see consumer price indexes increase exponentially. We don't see the cost of everyday goods and services increase exponentially. The CPI numbers that are coming out right now uh, for GBP for US right now is like 0.6%. It's They're not double digits. They're not really seeing that inflation. But if we are living in a world where we do see high inflation, people around the world, global investors are going to be putting their capital somewhere. If that somewhere is predominantly just gold, silver, and crypto, you got to think of the market cap, right? BTC market cap. Okay, let's not even look at BTC. Let's look at the cryptocurrency altcoin market cap at $96 billion right now, which sounds like a lot, but what is the gold market cap? It's like $8 trillion for the gold market cap. So if you're looking at it from a market cap standpoint, well, unless gold is going to go absolutely down, well, crypto is going to go up and that's going to be my view is crypto is going to go up. Yes, gold and silver are going to have a higher market cap. Their price appreciates, obviously, but the place for major possible appreciation is going to be in the cryptocurrency realm in my personal view. And that's why it depends on the economic environment we're in before just saying, yes, we're in a bull run. This could be like the bull run of bull runs, the, the biggest bull run in our lifetimes in terms of the crypto altcoins. If that is the case, if there is high inflation, people need to store their money somewhere, crypto is doing well, you hear neighbors, friends, family putting their money in crypto doing well, this is gonna be like an entire shift in wealth. Huge amounts of money is gonna be coming out of currencies, which will even put more sell pressure on those currencies and will be dumping into cryptocurrencies and with the amount of market cap that is in crypto versus gold, silver, and currencies, you can see how much of an explosion altcoins could be seeing. So in terms of $85 link, yeah, it could be a complete possibility if we do have the right economic environments and kind of the dominoes fall into play. Um, all right, boy toms. Um, been practicing a lot demo accounts for two years and I almost turned 18. Do you have any tips? That is awesome. My tip always to people is start paper trading, start simulation trading. Don't put money into an account, like live money in account just yet. It does not make sense. You are literally gambling if you have no idea how to trade in the financial markets. The second thing is do like when you are starting to trade and starting to build a solid plan and a structure and how you approach the markets, do not veer away from your trade plan. Write it down. Write it down on a Word document, on a pen, pen and paper, exactly what your system is, exactly what your approach is to trading in the markets. What? How are you going to look for pairing? How are you going to look for assets? How are you going to look for trades? If you do see a trade, what's your time frame? How long do you think they're going to hold it? What's the way that you're entering the market. Are you just going to set a market order? Are you going to set a limit order? Are you going to set a stop entry order? These like to the micro detail. And then how are you going to manage the trade? Are you going to reduce your risk? Are you going to move your stop loss higher when ABC happens? And then for take profits, how are you going to take profit? Are you going to set a solid take profit? Are you going to set a trailing stop loss? Are you going to set a moving average take profit? Whatever the structure is, you have to first back test it, know that it's profitable, and then trade it because if you trade things without knowing their profitability, it just does not make sense. Let's say you see some person trading head and shoulders and you're like, oh, okay, great. Head and shoulders must work. Well, if you don't back test it, you don't know the win loss that you personally have with the pattern and you don't know the average reward versus the risk. So you don't know the statistics before you trade it, which does not make sense. So before you trade anything, always, always back test it 
so you know the win loss or what you call a strike rate how much you win and when you win how much you win versus how much you lose and once you know those stats over a sample size of let's say 50 trades uh, around there 30 to 50 trades then you can confidently say i either have an edge or i don't and what is my edge how much do i win versus lose if i win let's say 60 percent of the time what is the probability of a series of successional losses in a row because that will inevitably happen if that is the case if you're only winning 40 percent of the time but your risk reward is let's say uh, four to one on average should you be risking a lot of money on on each trade like like three percent per trade because you could lose six times in a row you know if, if or five times in a row if you're risking three times three percent per trade that's 15 percent drawdown are you accepting that 15 percent drawdown if it happens right these are the types of uh questions that you have to ask not just risk management of i'm gonna lose 10 percent uh or sorry i'm gonna lose ten dollars per trade hundred dollars per trade thousand dollars whatever the case may be you have to not only ask the amount of money that you're willing to risk in terms of the dollar amount per trade we also have to consider what's your win loss and what would be potentially the drawdown that you would get into and then when you combine that with the average risk are you willing to accept that drawdown are you willing to accept that drawdown of like 10 20 if it's over 30 percent, that's a significant amount of capital to come back from uh, so just something to consider so i would say that would be a really good approach of Kind of taking when you are getting into the markets is you got to look at sample sizes you have zero edge trading a single one single trade like I, I could look at a particular trade but i have no edge in that one single trade but what i have an edge in is trading that exact trade over 50 times over 30 times right if i get the attempt 30 times in a row i have an extremely high probability of making money but if you give me only one of those trades, it's random. I can't assure you that I'm gonna make money on that trade. I have a probability, I can show you my stats, I can show you history, but I cannot guarantee you that I'll make money. So you gotta completely eliminate the thought of this is a good trade, this is a bad trade. Completely, right? You just gotta say, did I follow my rules? Yes, this was a good trade. Did I follow my rules? No, this was a bad trade. If, as long as you're back testing your setup and your structure and your trade plan and you know it's profitable if you follow your plan, you just follow your plan and that gives you a lot of confidence. So that's a little bit of my two cents and a little bit of advice for you is always, always, always uh, back test and make sure that you have a profitable system before actually trading it. And when you are trading in the markets, trade only what you back test, literally only what you back test. If it's not that criteria, don't touch it. Doesn't matter if it looks absolutely beautiful. Doesn't matter if a person pulled it. In my opinion, investments are different, but if you're trading in the markets, looking for consistent, profitable months, literally only do what you back test. Stay away from everything else. And that's the best advice I can give you. Um, let's look here. Uh, dog leaf top five mistakes you've made. I'll get into that right after I s answer Ungandak Kupliti. Have you ever considered investing into Forex? Uh, I think that is a very silly question. Um, personally, I'm not like trying to hate or anything. Everyone has certain questions. There's no stupid, que stupid questions. But in terms of the word investing in currencies does not make sense to me anyways, because all currencies are depreciating assets basically all of them. Yeah, they move up and down a little bit, but compared to sound money like gold or Bitcoin, it just makes zero sense. If you're investing in currencies, you're going to lose your money over time. It's almost like it is a guarantee. It's not almost a guarantee. It's a guarantee. Um, I do trade, I trade sh like short term swing trade in the FX markets, uh, but I do not and will not ever invest in Forex or any currency whatsoever. Just does not make any sense. Uh, and I am obsessed with crypto because I think this is going to be the future, not just in terms of the new technology that is coming in with the distributed ledger, with decentralization, but also for the next wave of monetary shifts that are going to be occurring, right? Right now, humans, central bankers are making decisions that is affecting the world, but it takes a long time for central bank decisions 
to have their repercussions, right? Central bankers in the 40s, 50s, and 60s didn't understand the severity of the inflation that the people in the late 70s would have to deal with uh, in the United States. For example, right now, we see the uh, Fed Chairman Powell basically drop interest rates to basically nothing and print a shit ton of money. He doesn't have to face any of the consequences with inflation. He does his job, he recovers the economy, and he is looked at, at as, as a king, as a person who did a great job, right? But then what comes from that is going to be an overheating economy, is going to be increasing interest rates because there's going to be increase, increasing inflation, right? And someone has to deal with that. Someone has to take the blue pill and say, well, shit, we're way, way over uh, indebted and we have to make sure that we're not going to just basically proliferate our currency. Someone has to be the bad guy and no one wants to be it. So uh, in terms of the future of monetary policy shifts, I think that blockchain should be and hopefully will be implemented so there is less human error going into the long-term effects of changing interest rates, which is federal funds rates, increasing, decreasing the balance sheet and uh, money supply within an economy. I do not think that humans should be uh, meddling with that, especially people in governments and central banks. They seem to not really get things right. Um, all right. Un Gandak says, I would suggest to target more intellectual people. You can go live on LinkedIn. I did not know that, to be completely honest. We have zero uh, exposure on LinkedIn. So, to be completely honest, that is actually probably a really good suggestion. So, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll actually look into it because it's interesting to open up new platforms. I did not know that you can go live. I don't know if you can post videos on LinkedIn. I don't know. I don't know too much about it, to be completely honest. I thought it was more of a social media platform if you're trying to get hired, if you're trying to network with other people within your sector or um, your niche, and then, you know, connect through that way. Um, Trucknob says... Makes sense. Dan says, look at Bitcoin in Venezuela. Yeah, exactly. We see transactions volume spike during the peak of the hyperinflation, much more compared to the peak of the Bitcoin bull run at the end of 2017. So that tells you something, right? When people need to use cryptocurrencies, they will turn to cryptocurrencies if they need, right? Venezuela, Zimbabwe is a really good uh, couple examples of what humans will do in times of monetary uncertainty when their currency is basically going to zero what do people do you see dash take a huge leap in the uh not usability but the accessibility and the transaction amount uh, of dash within venezuela as well as btc right um so overall i think cryptocurrencies are going to be the direction that people go to for trying to get a safe net for monetary uncertainty Trucknubs also said Road to Ruda is a book that talks about the Fed money printing oil and gold. Road to Ruda. Very cool. All right. So, yeah, that is a uh, interesting one that I will look over. Thank you for the suggestion. I appreciate that greatly. All right, let's now go into uh, dogs. You could 45 degree the camera for TikTok and work off two monitors. Great work, keep up, you rock, thank you very much. You could 45 degree the camera of TikTok and work off two monitors. Like this, I guess, it's kind of hard to see. Um, what we normally try to do is suggest people who are on TikTok to go on our YouTube channel because it allows you to view the monitor way more clear. Uh, the TikTok lives are just here to kind of get people exposed to the content. And then hopefully if the people enjoy it, 
they will come on to the YouTube where they have a lot more uh, clear of a view of what's going on. So that's kind of the reason why we did that. But LinkedIn, I will actually write that down. That's a, actually a pretty interesting place to be looking. So yeah, we'll, we will see. Wow, Paul, thank you very much for uh, all the stuff. I don't really know what those are, but yeah. Um, on TikTok is great, but here the children are dominating the platform. Yeah, I do agree on that for sure. Oops, sorry. Um, I do agree that they're dominating the platform to some degree. Um, I just didn't really think of TikTok or like our team didn't think of TikTok really when we were thinking about social media platforms. Didn't really know that they even have lives. So a little bit of do the due diligence on my part is needed, but um, good suggestion for search for sure. So we'll keep TikTok. I think it's pretty interesting, but I agree that the demographics are not suited for the content that we provide generally. Um, what we were thinking is that inevitably younger generations will be interested in it, but kind of seems like they're more interested in like, I don't know what young people are interested in dancing and like vaping. I don't really know. <laughs> so I'm a little bit out of touch in that department, but whatever. Uh, only for now, older people are coming unless it gets banned in the US. That's kind of what I was thinking is yes, younger people are on it now. Kind of like what a lot of people thought for Snapchat. It was basically only for younger people, but now a lot of content creators are using Snapchat. Instagram was just mainly for like, I guess Vine was also just for like younger people, but a lot of people made a name for themselves on Vine. Um, Instagram was like just for photography and then now everyone has Instagram. So it starts off somewhere and TikTok might be starting off at a pretty immature place that doesn't have a lot of viewers that are searching for this type of educational content. But I think it'll slowly come through as long as it doesn't get banned. So I agree with you on that one for sure. Paul, sorry back. What did I miss? Uh, not exactly sure. Hopefully you didn't miss too much, but I don't really know when you left. Um, all right, can you please look at stock dash Neptune dash? Yeah, I definitely know about Neptune dash. I really like that They actually based in BC. So it's pretty interesting. So let's um Let's see if we can take off something mm, Not really let's just open up a new one. I guess all right Neptune dash Mara is a good one GBTC. I believe is a, another ticker Yeah, great. That's great skills. Cool. Okay, so Dash, Neptune Dash Technologies. Very, very low liquidity, like extremely low liquidity. But let's go to the weekly. It's kind of nice because we're making higher lows. We can see that we're making higher lows, which is great. We are forming lower highs, so we are squeezing to some degree. So we see, I guess that right there to right there to right there. So it does look like we are squeezing on dash and I'll just draw this a little bit better. So we are going like this. So that's good. We're creating higher lows and lower highs squeezing towards the apex, which would probably be somewhere around here. But what is also something to note that we do want to be looking at is actually the price of dash because obviously that is going to be directly related to the profits that the company is able to generate, right? They are uh, uh, stacking, um, or not stacking, they are uh, staking, not stacking, they're staking Dash. So then the revenues that they make is in Dash. If Dash is appreciating, the revenues are increasing. So we can see that Dash is not doing a whole lot. Let's just bring it to the daily. And go just making a series of lower highs. Let's go like this. That's a much better trend line. I like that one. And we also can look to see it's very similar to BTC. If we're actually looking at it, if we're looking at it as BTC, I could kind of draw it like that, except it's forming more of a horizontal level of support that I see. So it's probably going to be looking something like this which isn't great. Uh, that's not awesome of a structure, <laughs> to be completely honest. So uh, kind of looks like this. 
kind of know what I mean. We see a massive dump to the downside, recovery, and then a descending triangle. And then again, you see a sell-off. So it's not looking awesome. Obviously, it's heavily dependent on what BTC does. But um, it would be really nice to see it break structure, at least this zone, because that would be a descending triangle. So then you'd be looking for something along the lines of a break, retest, key zone of previous resistance turn support, break, retest, and you're looking for a move to the upside. So if that is the case, that would be looking really good because that would be a descending triangle. But I think if you are looking at Dash, it makes sense to look at the actual cryptocurrency as well. And let's just quickly get This is kind of what I'm talking about is it's going to look very wonky and odd. Um, but you see a sell off a recovery. And this is kind of like that zone that I'm seeing right here, sort of, this is very hard to there we go. Kind of like that we see where we see a huge push pullback consolidation where we're forming lower highs in a horizontal zone. Similar to what we see here, huge sell off big rally forming lower highs while holding a key level of support, break retest, and then a sell-off. Massive sell-off, recovery, but not as high as that sell-off top. And then you get a horizontal level of support, descending zone. And then once you see that break to the downside, I think uh, we could be looking for some from short opportunities here. We don't exactly know. So let's just get this zone. Kind of let me be like that and you're looking for opportunities as the continuation goes down so we'll see how that goes i wouldn't say it's super bullish just yet to be completely honest with you um let's just go back to it i would wait until you are getting a little bit more of a confirmation because we are in a squeeze if it breaks this high that would be great to see because this is a previous level of significance so around the 18 cent range would be the price i'd like or the uh the area i'd like to see the price break above right around here because then that means that we've created a higher high breaking the squeeze and that would be a symmetrical triangle breakout and the continuation of the overall momentum for dash uh, the actual project um so um hopefully the live is not dead um i'm still online i can see that uh lastly linkedin is becoming more like facebook for intellectual people i did not know that uh i really hope that uh well i don't really I, I don't need to hope it'd be interesting to see what happens when we're on there let's just see that it's lost connection it's loading i hope it is going to uh so i did have a alarm go off that might have been the reason why it lost connection for a little bit i have alarms for different sessions within the fx market so right now it's at like the low session so I'm going to be basically going outside, enjoying the day a little bit for a couple hours, and then coming back before a little bit into the Australia session, especially into the Japanese Asian session, I will definitely be back on for a little bit more work. Um, that's why you should also have a device to watch yourself live, just to make sure you are still live. His live is dead. Sorry, don't know if that was my fault, but I meant like turn the camera sideways. Oh, okay, so you're looking... Well, that's the thing is I don't know if I want to um, be doing that because people have to then turn their phones. Could be like, that could be an option um, with like the light in the back, which is an awesome, but that could be an option. But I will look at the, uh, LinkedIn quite a bit. All right, so um, I don't think it's your fault, but maybe. Um, I'm all guys, have a nice one, and Perfect Monty, thank you for the live. Yeah, no problem, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it, and uh, we'll definitely look into the LinkedIn, so that could be an option. And thank you for the suggestions, we really appreciate that for the constructive criticism. We do take that to heart, and uh, we always try to think of ways to try to make this channel or kind of business better in any way we can and sometimes some simple things uh you completely miss over like linkedin i did not think about that at all and nor did uh kind of anyone else oops yeah i gotta get that rid of that alarm but anyways okay thank you very much for watching i'm gonna close it off there uh how's it going christian good to see you at the end of the live btc the one currency to rule them all 
yeah, who knows? Could be if Lightning Network starts to pick up, if there's a little bit more development in that section of uh, the transaction cost and the speed, that would be phenomenal. And I could definitely see that as an opportunity to uh, really ascend Bitcoin to one of the world, world reserve currencies, maybe. We never know. So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Until next time, have a good one, everyone.